Okay then. All right then. Uh, well, I'd just like to introduce Bill Greenshields. Uh, you know, a, a prestigious past and active in the trade union movement. And uh, I mean, he'd have to state his own positions for me not to get them wrong. Uh, uh, and the Communist Party EC member who's going to talk to us today about dialectical and historical materialism. And as the title suggests, this isn't an academic theoretical discussion about some, some abstract area of philosophy. It's a weapon and a tool to use in both our analysis and our strategy going forward. And, and if it's not seen in that way, theory and practice in a dialectical relationship, then we're not going to grasp situations in totality and we're gonna make mistakes. So I'm very glad, uh, uh, pleased to welcome Bill. And if you wanna proceed, and then we'll take questions and people can make contributions and questions at the end. So over to you, Bill. All right, thanks, Andy. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about a prestigious past. Is that? I think that's just another worst way of saying has been, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, um, I don't, I'm, a, I'm an EC member of the of the Communist Party. That's really all that uh, matters at the moment. Obviously, all of us have different jobs in the movement, and we tend to put different hats on depending what meeting we're in. Um, but for, for tonight, um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, as a member of the EC and to be talking about something which is a bit of a mouthful, of, actually, because originally um, Jim Reiki asked me um, we could do something on dialectical materialism, but also, obviously, there's the kind of current situation that we really need to encourage people to be talking about. And I thought, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? But you end up with a bit of a mouthful. Uh, dialectical historical materialism, a tool to the uh, whatever it is of the current struggle. It was put better for me um, a few good few years ago now uh, when we went to the um, Chinese embassy for uh, an anniversary where the um, Mao Tai spirit flowed quite easily and there were a hundred toasts um, for May Day, one of which was quite a surprise and it came about halfway through and nobody, everybody had a bit to drink um, and, and it sort of passed by without people noticing and then we thought what was that? And the, 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 the slogan was, the world is in crisis, the situation is excellent. Um, and, uh, and obviously for a slogan it's a pretty challenging slogan um, but it's, it's uh, the, the reality of it is and you probably already know this, that, and you've heard it before probably, but the, there is no single Chinese character for crisis. There are two, dangerous opportunity. So if you read it as the world is in a dangerous, as, is in a dangerous situation, but with opportunity, the situation is excellent. I think that sums up what, where we are at the moment in Britain and in Europe and the rest of the world really, as I'll talk about a little bit later on. But our job, um, the movement's job and the role of the party within it is to help minimise the danger and maximise the opportunity. That may sound obvious, but sometimes we just sort of go on from day to day and see how things are and press on. And we don't think about where it's taking us or what the likely consequences are. Um, and, and we've faced 40 odd, how many years ago in the 80s, the consequences of that that a very militant um, uh, um, period of, of, of trade union and working class militancy was met with the most ferocious counterattack uh, from the ruling class uh, by their chosen um, political representative at the time, Margaret Thatcher. Um, uh, and we, we, we know what happened. So we know where we are. We're seeing the rise again after uh, that many decades um, of, uh, of working class militancy. Mick Lynch is able to say with authority and support the working class is back and we're not taking it anymore. Um, but we know that when the ruling class hear that, they think, how are we going to respond to this? How and when are we going to respond? So we need to be able to analyze the situation, not just hope, not just wait and see, no wishful thinking. Well, what wouldn't it be nice if we can't do any of that? We have to be clear about what's happening um, in order to avoid uh, and minimise the danger of a counterattack from the ruling class, which will inevitably come. Let's face facts. It is going to uh, come. After 12 years of austerity, of pay cuts, of public service cuts, of 
um, growing uh, wealth disparately, all the things, the gig economy, um, all, all the divisions that they try to create through racism and so on. Um, after those 12 years, yes, Mick, Mick Lynch and others obviously can say that the working class is back. So we've now got the situation where my daughter, my, my midwife daughter, told me she's been told they're going to be balloted. Um, so from doctors to midwives, from barristers, uh, to junior doctors. My, I was, had a visit to my doctor the other day. I've got some twinges and he told me uh, that they're going to be balloted through the BMA um, and the uh, from posters, teachers, head teachers for the first time in their history as a union, uh, nurses, rail transport workers, civil servants, and, the, and there are more every day. So it's, 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 it's a list that is worth repeating, but it's never complete. Um, at the moment. And it's not just Britain. There's 130,000 people demonstrating in Paris uh, last Sunday uh, with strikers from the oil refineries, from schools, from transport, from the civil service, from the health uh, service, from the food industry, from the energy industry, and many more. They were just the kind of main cohorts of the CGT uh, demonstrating alongside uh, the public. We need the morning start to keep us up to date with all this. I hope everybody here gets it, uh, hopefully in paper form and probably in uh, digital form as well. But just stay on the morning start and you, there is so much news that you will never, ever hear in the, uh, in the mainstream press from around the world. So this is a crisis. It's an economic and political crisis. And as we know, the slogan of our ruling class and ruling classes elsewhere, I guess, is never waste a good crisis. Um, they have habitually used it to force wages down, to see profits increase, to cut services uh, because they're too expensive. Uh, so they say in order to privatise them, to understaff services, to force people into the privatised sectors, uh, to uh, reduce the efficiency of our public services to do the same, to extend monopoly control of industry as small businesses go to the wall and are eaten up by the monopolies in what we call state monopoly capitalism, where there's a fusion of the big banks, the big industry and the state um, in order to uh, 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 join forces against workers and to blame the working class for the crisis. There's a massive increase in private wealth at times of crisis. In the UK, um, billionaires increased their, 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 their private wealth by £106 billion since 2020. And worldwide, it's $3.9 trillion in 2020 alone. Uh, the billionaire, billionaires increased. I don't know about the millionaires, you know, the, the, the lower end of the massively filthy rich, but the top end, uh, increase their wealth and that's what they do with a crisis. Um, the other thing they do obviously is use it as an opportunity to, to introduce the most repressive legislation they think they might need and open the door for further legislation if it goes further th than they thought. So what we're going to be facing very soon I'm sure in terms of strikes is higher thresholds for balloting, um, further checks on uh, the data that, they, that you hold on your members uh, uh, in order to make the strike legal, as in, in inverted commas. Um, there's obviously the temporary service workers, right of employers to employ temporary service workers, or scabs as we call them, um, essential uh, service bans of strike action. They've got the Police and Crime and Public Order Act now, where secretaries of state are given the right to take out injunctions, not to go to the court to get secretary, to get injunctions, but secretaries of state to declare that where there is nuisance, that where there is disruption of infrastructure, where there is a denial of access to essential services or good, or where the public might be considered to be unsafe, they can put an injunction on demonstrations and opposition and resistance of any kind, whether that be a factory occupation, an A to B demonstration, uh, organizing in the community, they can put a stop to it and have you arrested if you ignore the injunction. So we know all this. Let's not be frightened of it, but we know all this. On our side, we've got old established campaign groups, political parties, um, and the trade unions, obviously, but community campaign groups. Uh, I'm very active in the People's Assembly. Uh, it was established back in 2013, but there's now all kinds of uh, sons of the People's Assembly. There's the 
um, uh, Enough is Enough campaign. Uh, there's the um, uh, 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 Workers' Economy campaign by Unite. There's uh, all kinds of campaigns springing up. Our job um, as communists and as just as ordinary working class people is to persuade those um, campaigns that they have an identity of interest and that they need to unify, not try to become the leader at the expense of the others, but to uh, but to bring that together. And that is going to be a big struggle. We'll discuss contradictions and differences in a minute uh, when I come on with dialectical materialism, but there, there are problems. For example, I don't think it's any secret, enough is enough. Is not supporting the 5th of November demonstration in London called by the People's Assembly, but is rather asking people to stay in their localities and, and support RMT strikes that are taking place on that day. Now, the struggle is hard enough, comrades, without us having that kind of disunity. Um, we're not going to solve it in this meeting tonight, but we can solve it locally. We can make sure that we are not on one side or the other in our localities between different campaign groups, but are bringing people together in comradeship. And if there are real differences, well, we can sort them out in the course of struggle. We don't want to divide over them at the beginning of it. Um, but the fact is, apart from our, our own little local difficulties, uh, if you talk to ordinary working class people, my family, my neighbours, my friends, um, they hold politicians in contempt. These aren't these aren't revolutionary socialists. They're not particularly political people, but they hold politicians, all of them, just about, with one or two noble exceptions that you might be able to point out to them. Um, but they hold them in contempt. They regard them as liars, corrupt, self-serving, in the in the pockets of someone who's um, manipulating them. Uh, you know, out of touch. All these things people say, as, as Mick Lynch said uh, at TUC, I don't know if you heard it, he said, don't get too excited, though, about the changes in the Tory party and the fact they're all sacking each other all the time. Yes, they are in disarray. He said, but, he said, but yesterday I took all the slugs out of my garden and when I woke up this morning, there were more slugs. He said, and that is the nature of the Tory party, that they will kill each other, dispose of each other, destroy each other politically, um, we can do the same, but there's always another Tory under a stone. So uh, the, the Tory party will survive, and it is backed entirely, obviously, it is the preferred party, the party of choice of the of the monopoly capitalist ruling class. Um, uh, out of pimps, they can uh, adopt and, 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 uh, and, and use the Labour Party. Um, they'd rather not. The Labour Party makes it easy for them, obviously, uh, habitually, um, by, uh, by not showing any guts. But the uh, but the, um, uh, the 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 preferred party choice is there. But the Tories, and I think this is where we start coming down to uh, not just a review of the current situation and the and the struggle. The Tories are not really the enemy, and we have to keep repeating this, and we even repeat it to ourselves because we tend to say, you know, uh, first part of a slogan and response: Tories out, um, Tory, Tory, Tory out, out, out. The fact is, though that the Tories can be there and not be there, but that massive economic and political power of monopoly capitalism is what is running this country, what is pulling their strings. And it is the divisions within the capitalist class which is allowing the Tory party to act in such disarray at the moment. Divisions that we should be capitalising on. Divisions between small businesses and the big monopolies, um, between uh, one nation Tories and fascists, um, and and these, this uneasy coalition um, of pro-capitalist uh, um, uh, people in, in, at local level and at national level. At local level, um, there's many Tories that we can uh, um, uh, get to be critical of uh, the more extreme policies, and we should do that. So don't ever let's think that that's a, a victory. So, yeah, we remember the, what happened um, from a United ruling class, united in the face of the minor strike, but before the minor strike, uh, the, the trade union militancy of the late 70s, and the, all the attempts to control it through legislation, through the National Industrial Relations Court by imprisonment of pickets, all of which were defeated by a mass movement of workers, not by the Labour Party, not even by the TUC, but by a mass movement of workers in which the, uh, uh, the Liaison Committee for the Defence of Trade Unions, in which many party members were leading, to, leading positions, 
um, led that struggle and, and, and freed the, the, the Pentonville Five and so on um, by, by mass action. And let's not forget it. When when um, um, Frances O'Grady made her very fiery goodbye speech, it was just such a shame that she finished with, and we'll show you, we'll see you in court. Well, maybe we will need to be in court, but that is not the place that we're going to win the battles. We might win short-term reprieves in the courts, but long-term it will be done by mass action by trade unions and communities across the country. And that's our job, not to simply restrict ourselves to going on big demonstrations, uh, though they're important and uh, they, they're like punctuation marks in the, in the narrative of class struggle, but they are not the class struggle itself. Um, so, yeah, we remember that Thatcher destroyed the was prepared to destroy the steel industry, uh, car manufacturing, obviously the mines, the print industry. She developed a national police force. She put um, soldiers into the police force uh, out of uniform in an unnumbered police uniform. They occupied towns and villages uh, uh, in order to prevent people from picketing during the mine strike. They closed roads and routes. Uh, they introduced all kinds of new laws. And of course, when the push comes to shove, they acted uh, as, a, as any um, um, a wounded beast will. It will lash out and the violence um, that was uh, uh, shown by them during the minor strike and during, during the whopping dispute, the print dispute, was extreme. We've got all that to come, comrades. I'm sorry, but I just don't see any other way of saying it. We're facing the same class again. Um, and they are just as vicious as ever they have been. So this is not going to end in a draw. Um, we're either going to inflict a serious defeat on them or they will on us. Um, and that serious defeat last time lasted since 1985 until fairly recently. It destroyed the confidence of a lot of trade unionists uh, and, and a lot of unions lost confidence in their members and began to act like a service provider instead rather than an organiser. Well, the organising culture is back and the NEU, my union, and the education union, uh, obviously in Unite, with Sharon Graham is, is doing a great job there. The, uh, the CWU, the SOLID, the, uh, the RMT, you can see where the unions uh, are leading is where they have been organising over these decades, reorganising, rebuilding, regrouping in the workplace. And that's where we need to be too all of us on this screen, in the workplace, if we've got one, or um, even if we're working on the gig economy on our phone, the, the uh, one of the new unions, I think the IWW did a fantastic job of organising the Uber drivers um, without ever having a meeting. It was all done over their phones. Fantastic work. And I think we've got to start um, thinking like that. I just want to share my screen for a minute. Um, I Hopefully this will work. Uh, can you tell me if you can see that? Can you see that? Okay. Um, this is um, a pamphlet yes, uh, published, published by the party. Um, and I'll just read you the opening or an opening paragraph in it. It says, in, in working out policy and strategy, communists need to identify the forces at play, the main contradictions and conflicts in any organisation, any political situation, any class struggle. How can we develop the forces that are on the rise and assist the demise of those that are dying away? If there is more than one contradiction involved, as is likely to be the case, then what's the principal main contradiction? How do we minimize conflicts which could potentially divide workers and maximize that which will expose the contradiction between working class and capitalist class, thereby strengthening workers and weakening capitalists? This is the very essence of social, historical, and political development, and therefore of practical communist politics, based firmly in Marxist philosophy and theory. It needs to be applied to everything in which we're involved. Um, now, I'm not even gonna try to uh, give you a lecture on dialectical and historical materialism. Uh, collect it can only be understood collectively, really, and in struggle is the best way where it can be applied to a particular problem and we can look at it. Um, but I'm going to just go through a few features of it, because, um, as you know, written on Marx's uh, gravestone um, is that philosophers have interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. 
And the point of Marxist philosophy, dialectical and historical materialism, is about change. It's about how things change and how human, humans, humanity and, and working class organisations can assist that change. So um, I, I just uh, um, from the from the kind of a uh, pencil drawing, the sketch of what's happening at the moment, how would we react? How do we need to react to maintain the momentum of working class struggle and avoid and minimize the attack from the ruling class. Um, well, I think first of all, the word materialism, dialectical and historical materialism. I'm aware some of you might be glazing over at this stage and thinking, well, one is said enough, but secondly, are we really gonna get a philosophical lecture? But as, as uh, Andy said at the beginning, for, for communists, this, they're one and the same thing. Um, some great leader once said uh, there was no revolution without a revolutionary theory. And uh, um, my favourite, Bob Crow, said, if you're going to battle without knowing how to win, you're going in without your boots on, which I thought was probably a better way of putting it. If we have to know how we're going to win, and that needs um, this kind of philosophical approach. It's not what we want to happen. Materialism is all about what needs to be done and to, to understand what needs to be done we have to look at the material fact that the forces that are at play our weaknesses and our strengths and how we're going to tackle the weaknesses and develop the strengths um uh, uh, so it's a matter of analyzing realities not i hate the expression when i hear it well we'll have to wait and see if we wait and see we'll lose um i don't want to hear well, let's hope so, because if we're hoping so, we're likely to lose. Um, we'd have to be very lucky not to. Um, we've got no great leaders who can decide these for us. They're just ordinary people, the men and women lead, leading this struggle. Uh, they're ordinary men and women who have spent a lifetime, in many cases or many years, building a working class movement and have got great experience. But they are fundamentally men and women like us. And we need, need to share the experience. And this is what we mean by materialism, is not relying on other people and on interventions by the great and good, not hoping, not waiting and seeing, but analysing and trying to get on with it. That's materialism. The material world, not an ideal world or something that we've dreamt up in our minds that we think we could try and achieve. Um, so we haven't got a catechism. We haven't got a utopia. Um, what we've got is class struggle and the next stage of class struggle. So that's all I'm gonna say about materialism. There's a lot more to say, and we might, and people here might well be able to say it better than me, so I'm sure I'm, probably that's enough. In terms of dialectics, dialectical materialism, um, it, it, it fundamentally means, I suppose it's easy just to, just to go into the four main uh, aspects of dialectics. The first thing is that everything is connected. Um, that you cannot see any part of the struggle or of life clearly without seeing as much of the big picture as you can and the whole of it if possible to understand how things are related everything is connected um, secondly everything is in a state of change there is no stasis there is no standing still there is no status quo there is only change some things in uh, getting uh, uh, developing getting bigger getting more powerful other things which have been bigger and powerful dying away and this is a, a feature of, of marx and engels pointed out of all life the natural world the scientific world uh, and the social world the world of workers and communities uh, and and struggle that there is a constant um uh, struggle uh, within things and everything is in a state of change uh, the third thing is that change isn't something that suddenly happens after nothing happened, having happened for years and years and years suddenly something happens and it might look like that at the moment it might look where the hell did all this working class strike action come from when there hasn't been any for so long but marxism uh, suggests that you only get big what, what Marx called qualitative changes, big, uh, important, um, radical changes, when, when small, um, gradual, uh, um, quantitative, as he called them, changes have been taking place over the years as a result of people beavering away, making things work. And I think you can see that. It's no, it's no 
um, uh, a surprise that it is the unions that have been working for 10, 15, 20 years on an organizing culture that are now well based to get their members out to vote in large numbers for strike action in the face of the uh, injustice of low pay. There are many other unions that have not done that work and can't get their, work, their people to vote for it because uh, they haven't done the, the preparatory work. They haven't made the small changes that have led to this, this big change. So yeah, so everything's connected. Everything is in a state of change. Change isn't a smooth process, um, but it is the result of uh, contradictions as, um, as Marx uh, referred to them. In fact, you know, the, the struggle of ideas um, where uh, people put forward different ideas is a contradict. There is contradiction involved in that. But contradictions such as the, the absolutely central contradiction in capitalism, that the higher wages are, the lower profits will be. This is a fact. We battle over what Marx called surplus value. That is the amount of money that the employer um, uh, makes uh, by not paying you the full value of your labor. In other words, we go to work, we make things, they're sold, we get paid so much, they get sold for a higher figure, the real value of them, and the employer takes the difference. That central contradiction is what drives forward all the demands about shorter hours, or the employer's demand for longer hours, for flexibility, as they call it, um, for, uh, you know, all, all, the, all the terms of conditions of work. Um, but it, but those contradictions are reflected elsewhere in my village. Uh, there's, there was a contradiction recently uh, where the very successful and popular school, um, was a, they were tempted to make it into an academy um, in order to uh, push forward that process of privatization, which began under Blair. Um, and there was a major contradiction between people who said that we don't want this and, uh, and heads and governors who said they did want it. So contradiction is everywhere, and it's the struggle over it that makes a decision about what happens next. And the and the and the argument or the side of the contradiction that comes out of that successfully tends to grow, and the side of it comes out of it less successfully tends to die away and become less significant. That can be reversed, of course. It can be reversed. Um, nothing is uh, irreversible, um, but uh, but but that, that's that's what it's about. So it's by trying to analyse all of these contradictions in our society and see the totality of the world. Um, I mean, we, we're not just talking about the totality of class struggle. Our struggle at the moment is taking place in a world where there are the same struggles aboard, but where there is imperialism, where there is war in Europe, uh, where there is uh, the environmental catastrophe, where there are attacks on democracy all over the world, where there's a rise in fascism in Europe again. These are all related, and this is what dialectical and historical materialism attempts to describe and attempts to provide the tools to analyse, but not just so that we can sit in the pub and talk about it, so that we can get our boots on with our late great comrade Bob Crow and get out into communities and show those communities that the struggle for wages and jobs is exactly the same, jo the same struggle as heat or eat, the same struggle as poverty, as energy um, poverty, poverty, as uh, cuts in benefits, as we have to show that this they are one and the same picture of a rampant ruling class supporting monopoly capitalism and undermining working class people in their every aspect of their life in order to see the growth of profit and of uh, private wealth. Um, when we get that picture in people's minds, once it's established, the force of the working class becomes unstoppable, I think. The old slogan, the workers united will never be defeated, is not true. The workers united will sometimes be defeated. But the fact is, again, as Bob Crow said, if you, if you don't fight, you definitely won't win. Um, if you do fight, you might not win. But if you don't fight, you definitely won't. But it's not good enough just to think, well, we'll have a fight and if we lose, we lose. The, what I think the theme of this meeting really is that we can know, uh, understand the world, we can analyse it, we don't need to be told by great figures about um, what they think about the world, um, well, it's interesting what they have to say, but we, we can have our own analysis 
and we can work out what we need to do. And in this circumstance, it's this, I think. We take part in all the national disputes, but we are not groupies. We don't go to every picket line in order to wave a flag and say we support you. It's nice to go. We should be there. We should make our views known. But we should be working with the people who don't go to picket lines, the people who are, uh, uh, who are homeless, the people who can't afford for their kids to leave home and get somewhere to live, the people who are working in the gig economy, people with three jobs, people who, who, who are on benefits and can't make ends meet, people who are being evicted uh, from their homes. These are the struggles that we have to identify with the strikers. And you put those together and you motivate and mobilise the working class, then we've got a working class that United would never be defeated. Thanks, Colmage. Well, I think that deserves a very considerable round of applause. I very much enjoyed that contribution, Bill. Thank you very much indeed. There's, uh, there's just while well, I'll just give some thoughts, just to, I can see various hands going up. Uh, and so I'll get to them in turn. But just a couple of points that came to my mind in terms of what you were contributing, Bill, was I, I've come to use this phrase myself in terms of the difference between materialism and idealism. And one example I've often heard, you know, uh, uh, various liberal outlets aspire is, oh, well, we got rid of slavery because people concluded it was immoral. Uh, and it was wrong, and it's not a bad thing, and that's why we got rid of slavery. See? And that's just not true at all. It was superseded by capitalism. And there's, there's, and also in terms of strategies and tactics and right and wrong, there's, there's the difference between idealism and materialism in my mind uh, is idealism tries to stand on some cloud of philosophy and dictate from the heavens above what's right and wrong, uh, and good or bad. And whereas I've always considered myself as picking a side in society, I haven't picked black over white or men over women. I've picked the working class against the ruling class. And I've picked a side, and I'm on the side of the working class. So therefore, in terms of strategy and tactics, I'm going to adopt the tactics and strategy that best meets the needs of the working class in the struggle that we're we're now facing, and and that's that you know that's the only way to overcome the easily created artificial divisions that the capitalist class promotes twenty four hours a day, seven days a week of why you should hate your neighbour or fear your the next person. It's it's horrendous, and so many people fall for it, and it divides the working class in so many ways. So I, I think your contribution, you know, uh, uh, reinforced that view. So I'm very pleased I knew I was right. And with that, I will ask Alex.